Welcome to the Tribe of Testimonies. Here you will find conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sharing their stories and their love of the Savior. My name's Andrea Hales. I'm Navajo, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and join us today. My guest today is Linda Azure Big Day. Uh, she emailed me just a couple comments a little while ago. And I've had people email me or comment before, and sometimes I reach out and ask if they want to be a guest, and sometimes I just reply to the email. Originally, I had just emailed her a thank you and a response to what she had said, but for some reason I felt inclined to later reach out to her and ask if she'd be a guest, and she was so happy to be a guest. So I'm happy that she was happy. She was so fun and joyful, and I hope you feel that with this conversation. Here is Linda. I am on the phone today with my new friend, Linda Azure Big Day. Uh, Linda, would you please introduce yourself in your tribal way as much as possible? If it's in your language, great. If it's not, that's fine. Not everybody speaks their language, and some languages are dead. Um, in my father's language, it would be Tanshi, um, which is Michif. And in my mother's language, it would be Hakoda, meaning high friend. Um, which is a Cinnaboyne or Nakota from northern Montana. Um, great. Uh, would you share something that you love about your heritage as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ? It can be pretty much anything, a story, a celebration, a way of life, a ceremony. What do you love as it relates to the gospel? I remember when I got my Indian name. And I was going to be going to school in Hawaii at the University of Hawaii. I was accepted in a program there. And so I was given my grandma's Indian name, which is Hawiwe Chinjana. It means moon girl. And um, it was a real special day. I remember that we had a, a ceremony and a pipe ceremony and relatives were there. And and then we had a, um, I was given a song and, and then, um, at the power that night at Wadopana and I was able to um, you know dance with my family and we had a giveaway for me that time before I was going on my journey you know far away from my family and that was really special and prayers were said and uh, the chief of our tribe uh, um, Mr. Four Star uh, Bob Forster had, you know, spoke at my, for me and said some prayers and it was really special. So it was a spiritual time and I had friends come from Canada and from the Crow Reservation and, you know, different places that, from my res that, um, you know, participated. So it was really a, a special time for me. That's cool. And I love that you said it's, um, a new name, but also it was a family name. Like we've, we've, I've talked about that a little bit with other people before, but, um, it's f for, uh, for us, it's special to know that we do have a new name, even though we're still the same person and it adds extra meaning to our life. Mm hmm. Yes, it it is special. I felt happy because I was told um, my grandmother got that name when she was a young woman. And my mother uh, asked my grandma if she would be willing to give her name to me. And so it was, you know, a special time when I was given that from my grandmother. So I spell. I always lived with my grandma, so... I was very close to her too. So I remember when she was getting, she was in the hospital and she was in her nineties and I left uh, work for Minnesota and went and spent time with her in the hospital in Wolf Point, Montana. And I remember her saying to me, Linda, when I get ready to pass, I want you to 
do a four day feed for me. And um, so she was telling me, you know, that's what, what she wanted me to do for her. And, and I thought, well, I know what to do because she taught me that, you know, she taught me a lot of things. So I just knew what to do with, you know, helping my family being part of, you know, having that for our grandmother. And in our way, the Nakota way, after our relatives passes away, um, well, we honor them one year later and we give gifts to everyone and we have a meal, you know, and prayers and and then we have a giveaway for them. And that's what we did for my grandmother. Her name was Elsie Miller Bruyer. Is there anything um, particular about the name Moon Girl? Like, what does what does that mean to you? Well, you know, the moon shines brightly at night, right? And I've worked with children all my life. As a, um, I became a social worker uh, when I was 24 years old, and I started working when I was about 34, 35 years old. I started in the Minneapolis public school system and I worked with children all my, you know, in my whole career um, in elementary schools. And I felt like, you know, a moon is bright, you bring light to people and you're happy. And that's my disposition. And so children make me happy when I work with them and they're, you know, they're very vibrant and beautiful and resilient. And so I feel like my name matched what I did in my career as a, as a school social worker. So, and I'm still working as a school social worker too. So. Yeah. Um, So you were telling me that uh, you grew up on reservation land and you were one of a large family. Do you want to tell us about your, your youth? Yes, I grew up on the Fort Peck Indian Reservation in Wolf Point, Montana, and I'm the fifth oldest out of 12 children. My parents are um, Lazar and Emily Azure. Uh, My mom, so I was enrolled on the Fort Peck Indian Reservation um, as a Cinnaboyne and Sioux because I grew up there where my mother's people were from and my dad was from the Turtle Mountain Indian Reservation. So I could have been enrolled in either tribe, but they only allow you to be enrolled in one tribe. So because I grew up where my mother was from, that's where I learned a lot of the ways there. But I also um, learned my dad's people's ways too, which are beautiful also. You you were telling me that your grandparents spoke different language is that who you said yes my grand my father's parents spoke Michif and my dad spoke it and his sister because there were only two in the family two children my father and his sister Rose and my mother's family my grandpa spoke Dakota and Lakota and my grandma spoke Nakota my mother's mother so But when they were, when my mother was growing up, she went to public school. Well, she went to a day school out in Oswego, Montana, because they lived out in the country, because everybody lived out in the country. Nobody lived in town, really. And um, they were, um, I think they were not encouraged to speak their language, even when my mother was little, but but my mother's, but they still spoke it, you know. My mother um, could understand it, but she preferred to speak English, but my aunt spoke the language. So she grew up around the language, you know, of her um, mom and dad. So, and so did her siblings. So, and my aunt is a Nakota speaker. She's in her, I think she's maybe close to 90, my aunt Lillian. But the and I still have a grandpa living, Willard Miller, my grandpa's my grandmother's younger brother. He's a language speaker. And my grandma had um her father, his name was Tatanga Huska, and they called him Tall Buffalo. But my grandpa was um a medicine man. He was a sundance maker. So um he would have sundances 
back, you know, on our reservation, which is a prayer ceremony. People fast for, you know, four days. They go without food and water. And I remember my grandma telling me that when her father, um, like, he'd pray about and dream about who people were that were supposed to dance in the in the sun dance. You know, you couldn't just show up and say, oh, I'm going to dance, you know. So it was a prayer, a prayerful thing when they would, um, you know, for those individuals that were sick and that needed to participate. Because one of my mom's cousins, she, um, her name was Dolly um, Bear Cub. And I remember she was a young woman and she was very ill and I might, I think my grandpa had a dream about her, my mom's grandfather, and and they wanted her to dance because she, so she could heal and get better. To me, that just shows faith, which is something that as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we're always striving to, to build and do is to show faith. Yes, I think our people had a lot of faith and they you know, rely on prayer a lot. Because I always grew up with prayerful grandmothers that prayed about all kinds of things, you know. And I know that I grew up superstitious too as a young woman. And as I got older, I, and when I got in the gospel, I realized that, you know, uh, Jesus Christ is, and Heavenly Father are who we pray to and you know, who we need to trust in. And, but I just remember growing up superstitious too, you know, and, and my my grandmother was aware of even the, you know, the adversary because she said his name was Wakanchija. And so she said, there's two people, you know, there's Wakantanka and there's Wakanchija. So she knew about God and the devil, you know, even that, um, and people would, you know, they, she would talk about medicine too. Like if people tried to use bad medicine on you, cause that happened among our people, you know, and people still might even use it now. But I know that my grandma telling me about that. You are a convert to the church. Want to, do you want to tell us that conversion story? I joined when I was like 13 years old. I was a, I grew up as a Catholic and I had just, um, I was made my first communion. I, that May, when I was like an eighth grader, um, I made my holy confirmation. And then I, somehow I met the missionaries and I always went to things at the church, like mutual and like they had volleyball dances and they would do fun things. And I remember one time they sent us on a scavenger hunt and I thought we were begging for food because I had never been on a scavenger hunt. I didn't know what that was. And, um, but I just remember the missionaries, you know, saying you have to go knock on a door and then you have a list and you ask for this, you know? And, um, I thought, well, we're begging, you know, I thought it was weird, but, (laughs) but anyway, so I met this one elder and then he started telling me about the preexistence and the book of Mormon and, so I was really interested in, in that. And, but when he started telling me, I already knew that it was true and I didn't even read the book and it just sounded just really good because even what my grandma would tell me about things, I thought that made sense to me, even though I was a young woman. And, um, but I, they had the, Indian student placement program, they called it. And so that's what I went on. Uh, My sister that was older than me went to Stefan, South Dakota to a Catholic boarding school, but my folks went to go get her because it wasn't a good place for her to be. So we, my sister Pauline, Sharon, myself and Connie, four of us went on the um, Indian placement program to Washington state because our, um, my cousins, the, bear cubs and the tattoos had already been on that program. And I think the parents told my mom about it and she liked it the way it sounded. So we went that fall and I stayed, um, you know, four years, I 
lived with one family and then another family, the Longhurst family. I went to the same high school and then I graduated from high school in Connell, Washington, but they were lived on a farm and they had a lot of kids and we worked hard and I just really loved being on the placement program. It was nice. And I met other students from other tribes and from Idaho and Nebraska and South Dakota, North Dakota, and just good people. And we attended, you know, Lamanite youth conferences like twice a year in the springtime. So those were always things I always looked forward to, but they were always really fun to get together. And then when I graduated from high school, I remember meeting this woman named that spoke at one of our conferences and, and I told her I was going to go, I wanted to go to BYU. And she said, well, I'm going to make sure you get in. And I thought, oh, okay. But I applied and I got it. I got accepted. So I went that August, you know, to school and I had an older sister. My sister Pauline went to, to BYU and it was just, wonderful and i was telling you earlier that there were like 500 indian lamanites at byu when i went so it was really great to meet people from different tribes and from canada and all over the united states so it was really nice man byu would look so different if it had that many native students well when i went that's how many they had in the 70s so and it was like really awesome. And I met, um, and we would always get a lot of, you know, like on the reservation in Montana, we'd always get a lot of Polynesian missionaries that would come up there and even elders from like, you know, Arizona and New Mexico, we would have a lot of native um, elders from different tribes that would come to the reservation. So the Indian people loved them. I mean, we treated them good all the time. Some of them even learned how to sing Indian and dance and, you know, but it was really nice because I went on a youth mission when I was in high school. I, um, my older sister went on one, my sister Sharon, and um, she went to Pine Ridge, South Dakota. And my friend Terry Clark, we were um, friends on the placement program, but she was from my resident. Um, she married a guy from Oklahoma, John Youngbull, but Anyway, her name is Terry Youngbull now, but she um, went on a youth mission. And then I went the next year, you know, on a youth mission to um, Santee, Nebraska and Nibrera, Nebraska. And that was really neat. But when I went there, I ended up having an appendix attack and I they had to try to get a hold of my parents for me to get surgery. And I almost died when I was on my youth mission. And then I had to go home and I didn't want to go home because I loved being on the mission, you know, but um, after I had that happen to me, I went home and then I went back on the placement program when I was, um, I think I was like going to be a senior in high school then. So you went to BYU, you were telling me you did lots of different classes and you were enjoying all of them, but you finally settled on social work. Yeah, and I didn't even want to be a social worker. <laughs> so, I mean, I took anthropology, I took a lot of science classes, and I I really wanted to be a botanist. And I thought, because if I was a botanist, I wouldn't have to talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas the social worker is the exact opposite. <laughs> I know, but I don't know. I love the study of plants, and I knew that I could grow. I don't know. I just love nature and I love everything that's green and I live in Minnesota now and it's a beautiful state in the summer and spring because there's many lakes and rivers and it's so green here and lush. I love it. So, but I grew up in Montana on the plains. So 50 miles from Canada and hundred miles from the North Dakota border. So I grew up on the rolling hills and plains and I love it there too. So it's, you know, I love seeing the open spaces when I go back there. Because whenever I would get done working in the summer, after, you know, when school would get out, I'd drive to Montana and be there maybe about a month or stay there with family and visit relatives because I didn't want to be in the city, you know? Yeah. It sounds like you just are connected to all things God has created, nature. 
I love nature. And even when I remember walking when it was 10 degrees here in Minnesota, people do a lot of outside door activities. So, you know, it's not, I mean, if it's 40 that you don't really need a coat. I mean, you could put on a vest and go for a walk. I mean, I even went for walks when it was 10 degrees, so I didn't care. But the cold, the fresh air is always nice. Yeah. You were telling me that you haven't always uh, been active in the church, um, and but now you are. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that journey? Yeah. When I was, um, I was telling you when I had that, um, I guess, dream of getting married in the temple and, you know, like uh, getting married and having a lot of children. That's what, that was my goal, but I don't think that was the Lord's goal for me at that time. But I, I feel like I was a bit disillusioned because a lot of my friends were getting married, you know, not every one of them, but, um, and then I just, after I went to the University of Utah, I left the church and I would go sometimes, but not like regular and I think I kind of got inactive even when I was at BYU towards the end you know and then when I went home on the res I didn't even go to church much because I went to a lot of powwows and hung out with my friends that you know were dancers and and we just went to a lot of powwows and um had that connection and then I would see people that I went to school with at BYU it was always good to see those friends because I knew they were still in the church some of them I don't know if they all stayed but it was nice to um just see them because it was always you know pleasant and I always believed in the priesthood though and I knew the Book of Mormon was true um but I always prayed a lot I was even though I didn't go to church I always prayed because I grew up praying. My grandma's taught me how to pray and and I just always believed in prayer, you know, and leave, you know, listening to the spirit and um and then when I I worked like when I got out of graduate school I worked in western Washington for a tribe out there, the Soxhawatl tribe and I was going to some of their native uh you know, ceremonies, I got invited, so I went. And then, um, and then when, when I was in graduate school, my dad was murdered. And um, when I was at the University of Utah, and I was going to get married and, and um, my mother called me up one night and said, well, your dad's gone. And I remember saying, well, let me pack a bag and I'll drive home. And she goes, well, you can't, you need to fly. But anyway, that was a a very a thing that hurt my heart so much in my life but I thought about my dad and I was thinking that he would just want me to love people and serve others and just be good to people that was what I thought about my dad you know and and so I felt like well that's how I'm going to try to live and um and then when I worked out in Washington state and in social work I worked on the reservation like I did Indian child welfare on my resume, that was very hard, that kind of work, because I was related to a lot of people. And um, and then I worked in mental health. You know, I did worked at the VA. So my last social work job and was working on the Crow Reservation as a um, with Crow Family Services for the Indian Health Service. So I was like a social worker that did many things and love the people there you know i remember um when i first drove there with a friend when i graduated from college and i thought i would never live here well guess what i did live there and i loved it and on a family adopted me there the peggy white well-known buffalo that family adopt, adopted me and um they live in gary owen now but um anyway my husband is crow he's from prior his name is jace big day and um anyway so his family's Catholic, but, but I went to a lot of sweats and, you know, learned a lot of their ways when I was in Crow. Um, I never learned how to speak the language, but they accepted me, you know, and I did a lot of things and, um, and I didn't, 
I went back to the my birth religion when I was living there. I went to the Catholic Church because a lot of my friends were Catholic, you know, and they did Native things too, like um, the sun dance and different things and sweats. And, and then I went, I was recruited um, to go to get my master's in public health at the University of Hawaii in 1988. And, um, and I went, I was, I don't know, I just, I thought I had an opportunity to go. And so I went and I got my MPH degree in Hawaii. And, and I remember flying from Seattle and seeing these little islands. And I was thinking, what the heck am I doing here? You know, after leaving Montana, but I loved it there. I met many uh, Hawaiian people and I kind of became an activist with them and connected with those people. So I was always like a, you know, a rebel, I believe, like for social justice or whatever, being a social worker. And um, and then I got my um, MPH degree and then I was, didn't work for a while. I remember crying to my mother about not having a job when I got, a, you know, my second master's degree and my mom said Linda she said don't worry about it you're going to work the rest of your life enjoy the time off because she said you're going to get a job I know it and my mother was always you know encouraging but my dad was too like that you know they just wanted the best for us and so um I remember um I was visiting my cousin in North Dakota he was a, a minister for the Assembly of God Church and I stayed with them for a week and he goes, you should stay with us longer. And the spirit said, go home to tomorrow. So I went home and I ran into a friend, Dana runs above. And she said, Linda, my mom has a job for you in Helena, Montana. So I went and lived with her parents for a while. And I met this lady, um, Joan Myrick that worked for the American Indian Healthcare Association in St. Paul, Minnesota. And she met me at the, cause we were doing, workshops for AIDS for tribal and urban Indians in Montana. And I met Joan there and she was um, on this campaign about AIDS, you know, teaching it and that type of thing. And, and so when I met her, she said, I want to hire you. And I said, okay. And then she said, you can live with me until you find a place to live. So she actually let me live with her. And then I got to know her boys. And so when she traveled a lot, I was watched her children because she did a lot of traveling in her job so and then I worked at the same organization as a, a program analyst you know it was on an IHS scholarship that I had to pay that back because that's what I got when I went to the University of Hawaii but when I was in Hawaii I worked for a professor Dr. Raymond on AIDS so I learned a lot about it when I was there and then I did my master's thesis on rheumatoid and osteoarthritis. So I, that was different, but um, anyway, and when I was there, I went to church every Sunday, but I, it wasn't the LDS church. I went to the Newman Center with friends. So I, and I would rock, walk right by the Institute, I think, but I never went. I don't know. I just was on that path. And then when I moved to Minnesota, I worked at that organization and um, I don't, know how I, and I would meet these people, you know, I started working as a volunteer for the Women of Nations. And one of my friends, she was, she told me, she said, Linda, you you seem different to me. And I said, well, I'm a member of the church, you know, and she said, well, I'm um, LDS too, but I don't go to church. And I said, well, I don't either, you know, and, and then she said she went on the placement program. So I met people that were members of the church that were L, you know, that weren't active, but I met them because they'd share that with me, you know, and a lot of my cousins over here were Catholic. So I just went to, still went to the Catholic church, but, and then I don't know, I met the missionaries. They started calling. I know what, I went to a dinner party with these friends and I gave them my business card. And then the missionaries started calling me at work. And I thought, well, I'm already going to church, you know, and, and, and then I thought, and I thought the Lord wants me back for some reason. Anyway, so then they kept calling me. And then finally I started letting them come over and teach me 
because I said, I need you guys to give me the lessons again about coming back into the gospel. So they did. And um, I knew it was true. And one time I, the missionaries came over to my house and gave me a priesthood blessing. And then they said, Sister Azure, that's my maiden name, could you give us a ride to church tomorrow? And I thought, well, of course I'll give you a ride, especially if you gave me a blessing. So that's how I started going back. And um, yeah, and I really felt like the adversary was really working on me hard not to um, go back to church. But I just feel like Heavenly Father had a, you know, a lot for me to do among our people. And um, I remember when I, in 1991, I think that's when I got my endowment. Um, I remember I bore my testimony and I said, well, I was taking those temple preparation classes. And then I said, I think I'm ready to go to the temple. And then right away, my home teacher, after I bore my testimony and church was sacrament me was over, he came up to me and he said, well, we want to take you this next Saturday to get your involvement. <laughs> so I did, you know, and so it was, and then I met these Indian ladies that were from Oneida, Wisconsin, Shirley Paulus, Rita Summer, and Mary Dodge. And they were at the temple that day in Chicago, because that's where I got my endowment. And they said, well, did you get married today? And I said, I think I was 30. I don't know how old I was. I was maybe in my early 30s. But I said, no, I just came here to get my endowment. And I didn't, you know, I just loved the temple. It was so beautiful. And and so I met them and then I became good friends with them. So I used to drive up to Oneida and visit them, you know, from the Twin Cities. And um, I remember this one time I got gas in my vehicle and I left my wallet at the counter in St. Paul. So I drove all the way to Wisconsin. I was going to get gas and I didn't have a wallet. So somebody from the church came and gave me money, um, you know, to fill up my tank. And then I said, I will pay you back when I get home, I'll mail it to you. So she trusted me. And I, you know, they, I think my wallet was still at that gas station and nobody took it. You know, I left it on the counter and, and I remember sending the money back to that lady, you know, and I think I was in Wausau, Wisconsin or somewhere, but anyway, so I didn't make the trip up there to visit those ladies because I had to tell them what happened. But anyway, um, just uh, things in my life, the Lord blessed me. And, um, and then when I got a taste of the temple, I loved it. So we would take temple trips to Chicago and they called it the red eye special where we'd get on a bus at night and drive all night. And then early in the morning, we'd get ready and go to the Chicago temple and then spend till two o'clock there and then come back, you know? So my Thanksgiving would have been leaving with friends that were my Polynesian friends. And we'd drive to Chicago and go to the temple the next Friday because we didn't get a temple in um, St. Paul until 2000. So in the 90s, we were driving. I go to. I made a commitment to go to the temple once a month. So I had a, a van. So I was always taking people to the temple with me all the time, you know. But we shared gas and um, you know hotel room. So and then we went on buses too. So yeah. So I felt blessed. That's. Awesome. I love that. I also love the story you were telling me about um, how you re-met your husband, how you came back into his life. And I mean, you you didn't get married when you were young, when you were going to have eight kids. So that your life has been totally different. Yeah, it has. And I met my husband in 1995. And I met him through family at Crow and we were at the Crow Fair and we, um, well, I dan I would dance there, you know, and so, cause the family that adopted me gave me an out, they outfitted me. And so I'd go there and dance. And so we hung out and I had a couple little younger brothers, Scooter and Boots and, and Scooter was always hanging around me all the time. And so, um, I met Jace and we, 
hung out at the Crow Fair. And then, of course, I lived in, I, those were the times when there was no cell phone and it was a landline phone and you wrote letters, right? So in the 90s. And so I remember writing letters and calling and then pretty soon it kind of fizzled out anyway. But, um, and then I had heard he got married and, and then just this year, I remember leaving work and telling my friend Ari, um, Ari, I think I'm ready for a boyfriend. She goes, you are? And I go, yes, I am. And, and she goes, are you sure? You know, she was really asking me all these questions because we were probably the last to leave in the school that day. And I was, um, I was going to go visit my foster brother and his wife. Uh, David and Chris in San Francisco, but the spirit told me to go to Billings. And I thought, um, well, my brother was having open heart surgery to my younger brother, Craig. And I thought, well, I better go support my brother, I thought, you know, and so I flew there on a Saturday. And then I had dinner with my siblings, and they were all with their spouses. And I thought, I'm always the fifth wheel. But anyway, so I heard there was a powwow at MSU Billings. And I went to the powwow and my um I knew I was gonna see family there from Crow, so I did and and then I sat by them and and then I saw um Mrs. Big Day, you know, and she said, Did you know that, you know, Chase's wife passed away? And I said, No, I'm sorry to hear that. And and then she held my hand for a long time and then asked me for my phone number and she said, I'll give you mine, but I didn't get her number. She got my number. And so um, so I think that right there and then she probably thought, oh, this is who I want for my son. <laughs> I mean, that's what I would joke with him about. I'd say, I think your mom already picked me when she saw me at the powwow. <laughs> because she knew that I had never married and that I was single. So I was a career woman all my life, right? And, and I've traveled in the world and I've done many things. Um, and I feel like I've been, had a blessed life. You know, I've been to Mongolia and New Zealand and Sweden and Ireland. And I presented at social work conferences, you know, international school social work conferences, you know, in my different places I went to. But um, anyway, um, yeah, so it was, I never saw him until that Thursday. and. And I just, you know, I said, bring a chaperone, but we got to meet and he just seemed the same, a sweet man and kind. And I just remembered how nice he was, you know, and, and I thought, I think I like him. He seemed just such a kind person, but I thought about, well, he's a widower, you know, and um, I know grief can be hard because I've dealt with people with grief and my own grief in my life when I've lost friends or family members, you know. Um, but with the gospel of Jesus Christ, I feel like our grief isn't so sad, especially when we know that we're going to live again and um, that we have the atonement of Jesus Christ to help us with that. But sometimes I think people in the world don't understand that. You know, they, but when I wasn't in the church and after my father died, I really suffered and I grieved for my dad for about eight years because I did a lot of crying. I remember and when I was leaving Crow, I remember I'm, I cried every day when I was there and I thought, I love these people. I'm, I got to go. I need, no, I need to move on. And I remember crying every day and it was just, but I got over it. I don't cry as much as I used to, but I was younger then, but yeah. So what are some of the blessings that you have seen in your life that could only show that Heavenly Father loves you as an individual? Um, well, when I got my endowment, when I became a temple worker, when I came back to, I lived with my mom on the res for two, well, I went to help take care of my mom in 2011. She asked me to move back, you know, to, um, be with her to help her and I the door was open you know I got a job before I left I had a roommate to live with when I got there and he just doors have always opened for me when I've listened to the spirit and what heavenly father has always blessed me all my life I can never say that he has never blessed me because 
I've always been greatly blessed. And one of my friends that's not a member, she goes, Linda, you've had a good life because she said, God always blesses you, you know, and I thought, well, he has. But um, I think when I came back, I remember I wanted to be a temple worker again, because when I lived in Montana, I would only go to the temple once a month in Billings, because I, you know, couldn't go every, well, it was expensive, but, you know, once a month I went, I remember going and coming back and asking the temple president, I would like to volunteer to be a worker in the temple. And he said, sure, what are you doing tomorrow? And I go, nothing. And so early in the morning I started. So I, tomorrow I work at the temple at like, I have to be there about 5.30 in the morning, but, um, and then my shift's done at 10. So, but anyway, so being a temple worker, um, I work in the nursery, um, you know, at church. And when I moved back from Montana, I was in the state you know, primary and been in stake young women and just leadership and church here. And, and then I, um, you know, always ask the Lord, why me, Lord, you know, but I feel like he put me in positions to grow. Um, I think I've always loved people all my life. And so I've always, that's been a, maybe a, a blessing to me to love others, you know, um, and be kind to others. And I think about um, now my, actually, I was going to retire this year from my school and then go on a full-time mission, but I got married instead. My husband's not LD, I, LDS, but he's a good man. And um, I, um, I feel like that's my mission, you know, being with my husband and learning how to be a wife and a, a mother to his children and and grandkid grandma a caller to his grandchildren so i feel like i'm being blessed in that way you know even though i've never had my own children because i've mothered many children in my life as a school social worker and i am getting a new job i'm starting at an american indian magnet school in saint paul on december 5th and and I'm retiring from Minneapolis because I've been there for about 30 years. And I'm going to start a new job in St. Paul. So, and I, and I like that because, you know, I pray with my husband and, you know, he was saying to me that he encouraged me to apply for that job because it's closer to home. Because uh, one day in September, when I was um, going to meet a family outside my school in Minneapolis, um, they had a shooting outside our school in South Minneapolis. And I remember, I didn't want to tell him, you know, when I got ready to go home, I, but I asked the cop, I said, oh, is it okay to, for me to drive to my car? And he said, it is. And I thought, ooh, I don't feel safe. But so I called my husband and I told him that, you know, what happened and he didn't say anything. And I thought, I think that stuck in his head though. But it was like, you know, I, wasn't going to tell him. And then I thought I need to tell him because he's my spouse and what happened. But you know, that was, that was scary. Um, and they have a lot of carjackings in Minneapolis and, you know, it's just not safe. I don't know. It wasn't that way when I worked there many years ago, but, um, and, you know, last year our school went on strike. So I was marching in the streets of Minneapolis, you know, with our, um, MFT and the people from my school and and then um, and then when George Floyd died that was like about three quarters of a mile from my school so you know a lot of stuff happens in that city never uh, never sleeps yeah you said you go to the temple a lot and that brings you peace um, what else brings you peace um, going for walks you know nature I love to travel. Um, since I've been married, I have to put the skids on traveling because my husband, you know, he works, um, in a job where he just started. So, um, there isn't, well, I mean, I'm not going to be able to travel like I, cause usually like during Thanksgiving time, I would stay with friends here, but 
when Christmas I'd get 10 days off, so I'd always travel. You know, I'd go visit family or mostly visit family, like go to New Mexico, see grandkids over there. But my sister's children call me Grandma Linda. So I would go down there and spend time with them. But I had to let them know that I'm not coming this year, even though I have a ticket, because my in-laws are coming for the holidays. So, Well, I I love all the things that you've, you've brought up. Is there anything you want to talk about before I ask you the final question? Living the gospel has brought much peace in my life and living the commandments and, um, you know, being a full tithe payer, fast offering, all those things. I believe in that. I've never struggled with those, you know, and, and I've had friends that, you know, struggled with that, but I feel like when I've always paid my tithing or paid my fast offering that the Lord has always blessed me, you know, and, and just helping others. Like I'm going to be going to visit a friend in the hospital after this today. Um, and just, you know, just, there's always somebody that needs our help wherever we are. So I just, encourage to just love others always you know and be kind and courageous you know don't be afraid and sometimes i would used to pray about who could i give a book of mormon to and you know every morning i like to listen to the um, book of mormon videos because that sets my day or the conference talks and i think about well what message does heavenly father want for me to do today to help somebody you know and sometimes our helping somebody could be our own spouse, even, you know, or somebody in our family. But yeah, and I believe in angels because I believe as women in the gospel that we can pray for angels to come around us and help us. Even I do that at work with children that are struggling. In my head, I'm really praying when that little kid's struggling and I ask, for those angels to come around and I believe they're there so and I believe in like what our prophet says to go to the temple and find peace because as the world is getting more tumultuous and wicked that we really need to have the Holy Ghost in our life and to guide us in what he wants what the Lord wants us to do me too well I have one final question for you. What does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel? Um, it makes me honored as a daughter of God and a child of God to be from the house of Israel because I know that our people are a sacred people and that when Christ comes, that we're going to be there to meet him and that we need to be ready because I read something this morning or I heard something that President Nelson said that you know we need to prepare to act as if it's like your last day on earth you know so do the best you can that day because I was listening to a podcast or when he lost his wife you know and um and I think about like I feel like needing to be our best person every day and acting like it's our last day on earth. That might sound crazy, but we don't know when we're going to be called home. But I want to, I want to be ready with, you know, be the best possible person I can be. And I know that our people are a blessed people. And I see how our native people struggle because I work with them in the city here. And, and my heart really goes out to them. But I see when they're when they're, um, you know, I thought if they just had the gospel of Jesus Christ in their life, they wouldn't have their kids taken away. They wouldn't have to struggle. They wouldn't have the struggles of drugs and alcohol, you know, smoking and all of that. And it's like, we should, we need to be a light to our own people. And um, that's what I hope that I have done in my lifetime as a daughter of God and from the house of Israel. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. It's been so great to visit with you today.
Yeah, thank you. It was nice to. I love your podcast. I listen to them every week because <laughs> I I get something out of everybody. That's um, you know I love listening to the people that their testimonies and their stories. So a few days ago, I got to go to the temple with my husband and with some of our friends. And sometimes when I go to the temple, I I don't get a whole lot from when we do the endowment session. But this time when we went to the temple, man, I just was like, I wish I had a notebook and a pen and a paper. And yeah, I just... It was like a download of different things, all small things, but all just happy, good things. And it was like Heavenly Father was reaching out and hugging me and holding my hand and just letting me know that he loved me. Uh, I've been trying really hard to have the spirit in my home, like purposely have the spirit here in our home. <clears throat> and ask Heavenly Father to send away the bad spirits so that so that good spirits can attend easily. I feel like that that has been a blessing in our home, and we are all recipients of that. This is a good season, this Christmas season, and I'm so thankful for our Savior Jesus Christ. I have this friend, her name is Ruth Young, you may recognize her name, she was a guest at the beginning of the podcast in 2021. Anyway, so she gave me a gift to give to you. It is a ceramic nativity. It's native themed. Um, it has been horsehair burned. It's not the fine ceramic with the horsehair. It's just really nice ceramic with the horsehair. So... Um, I will post pictures of it and I would love it if you would write me an email, if you would share a podcast that has been your favorite episode this year and tag Tribe of Testimonies either on Instagram or on Facebook. I would love if you know somebody who might be a good guest. I'm going on 66 Tribes. And I would love to expand, to increase that number. We we have a lot of Navajos. So like I said, I'm trying to increase the, the distribution of tribes represented. Uh, basically, anything that you can do to spread the word of Tribe of Testimonies that's public enough that I can see it, I'll count you in as um, the Nativity Giveaway. I will let you know by December 27th. I know it's after Christmas, but that will be the the uh, episode where I will announce the winner. Anyway, I hope that makes you a little excited. I hope that brings you a little bit of joy. And I hope you have a super wonderful, awesome day. Tribe of Testimonies is not sponsored by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The music is a traditional hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, arranged and performed by Kyle Forsyth. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear how this podcast is affecting you. And I'm always looking for guests. If you or someone you know would be a great guest, you can reach me at tribeoftestimonies at gmail.com. <laughs>